All right, folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it means it's time for another episode of the Rec Poker Podcast. So, of course, I have to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, and website AMP, um, because that's how we get to keep this a free community. Uh, If you don't know that much about Rec Poker, A, thanks for tuning in. B, head on over to rec.poker and sign up for a free account. All it takes is an email address and a smile. And you can hang out with uh, members of the Wrecking Crew, our premium members, our hundreds of uh, community members, which which have a free account just like you, to use the forums, post their own hand histories, play in the home games, uh, get some free strategy videos and training uh, opportunities. And of course, you can always go premium uh, if you use the code Rec Poker, your first uh, first first month is only five dollars, and if you do it before June first, it's not too late. You can get your name entered into a grand prize draw on June first of all our premium members, uh, and one of those lucky members is going to win a five hundred dollar entry into the WSOP bracelet event number fifty five, the tag team event. Uh, the only downside is you got to play with this guy, but I'll be there June twenty sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. Um, so if, uh, you're a premium member on June 1st, maybe you can come and join me for free. I know you like that sound. Um, anyway, so thinking of things we like the sound of, I've got the best freaking job in the world. I get to hang out here every week and talk to these amazing folks about, uh, poker strategy. Uh, so you can learn more about me and everyone else on the wrecking crew by going to rec.poker slash crew. Uh, but you can also just hear from them right now. Heads up guys. I'm Rob Washam and I'm Rabman 50 just about everywhere. I'm Taylor Moss. You can find me in the home game as Gopher Boy TJM and on Twitter at Taylor underscore Moss. There you go. And um, we're always welcome. And if you're a premium member uh, like our man Joe here, you're welcome to come join our chat. Uh, We record these on Monday nights. This is the forums edition. And um, we always encourage our premium members to take a hand or a forum post that's interesting to them and bring it here on the air to talk about it with the group. Um, So this week, well, it's Monday night. So A, it's a little after 9 p.m. Eastern, which means we're all playing in the Rec Poker home game. Actually, I'm not because I can't multitask anymore because I'm old now. But (laughs) we could be playing in the uh, Play Money uh, home game for Rec Poker members where you can win some prizes for free. That's a lot of fun. Um, The other thing we do every Monday night is we take a forum post from the Rec Poker forums and we talk about it here on the air. So this week, we're looking at a forum post by 7high11, uh, one of our premium members, John, who has been lighting it up lately in forum land. Uh, John's been uh, a premium member for a few months now. He's been uh, joining our strategy conversations, our group discussions, our study groups. He's posting in the forums. And just before we recorded on the air here, a few of us had some very complimentary things to say about John and the journey that he's on. So John, if you're listening, um, we're all just really impressed with the steps you're taking. You're thinking about things in the right way. Um, and we think you got a lot of uh, success in your future. So um, thanks for being a Rec Poker Premium member. And remember us uh, when you when you make it big, buddy. So this is a question uh, that I think we get, uh, as recreational players, we encounter this a fair bit. Uh, so John says, the, the name of the post is one mistake or many, ace, ace from the button. And it really comes down to whether to slow play pocket aces and kind of what happens when you can. So uh, I'm not sure how, how far into this actual hand we'll get. We'll see what the panel has to say. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what are the factors that you should consider when you're sitting there with a monster like aces? When is a good time to slow play? When's a bad time to slow play? What are some of the costs and trade-offs associated with it? Um, because it is a, it's a point where, you know, Sometimes you can outclever yourself a little bit, and uh, I think you'll find it has a lot more to do with stack size and player type than anything else, but I'll be curious to uh, involve the rest of the panel with this. So basically, uh, John's playing this hand. He's got aces on the button. Um, it's been, it, it all limps around to the, or he's on the hijack, sorry. Oh no, he is on the button, my mistake. He's on the button with ace-ace, eight players at the table. It limps around to the hijack, who opens to 15. Um, and then John is in this position where he's given this option to be either calling along for 15 or re-raising over top. And this is a spot that we're going to encounter a lot. Um, what is there a Taylor and Rob and Joe, if you're interested in, um, is there, 
is there like a default rule that you have in spots like this? And if so, what, what is it and what kind of helps you think about whether to, whether to do that or not? Well, first of all, this is a cash game. This is a one, two, no limit cash game. Great. And he, he's sitting there with less than a uh, hundred big blinds. My primary goal in this spot is to get it all in. Mm. And I, if I can get it all in pre-flop, I'm, I'm doing it right now. Um, it, it, I think in a cash game, when you're sitting there with aces, the best scenario that you could possibly get is to get all your chips in the middle before the flop comes out because you're going to be ahead of whoever whoever happens to get in there with you right so i i think that slow playing aces i mean there are spots for it um obviously in a in an mtt for instance when you're sitting at the beginning stages with 100 big blinds you don't necessarily want to stack off right away even though you've got the best hand in poker but in a cash game, that's your primary goal is to get all your chips in the middle when you're ahead. And if you can do that pre-flop, you go for it. Yeah, and that's a great distinction between cash and uh, tournament play because, of course, you should be approaching it differently and stack sizes are going to be a big factor there as well. Ed, yeah, Joe? Well, I, I think when when I look at aces, I mean, it's, it's the best hand pre-flop, but the minute that the flop comes around, you're going to be in trouble. So you better have a plan for what you're going to do with them as it goes forward. And every, you know, I, I think that one of the quickest lessons I had to learn was that every street deteriorates aces down and puts mm. you in a tougher and a tougher spot until such time as pretty often by uh, the river, if you've got people calling along, um, it's a bluff catcher and it's weird to think of aces as a bluff catcher, but it becomes a bluff catcher a lot of times by, uh, you know, depending on the action that you're getting uh, and, and the betting that comes along. So it, position, I think makes a big difference in terms of what I'm going to do. If I'm early position, I might try to limp re-raise or, or, you know, I might consider that, but in a later position, um, and I'll be interested to hear the panelists thought on this. I am much more likely to, to as Rob said, to, to get that three bit in, um, maybe even four bit, and really try to push as many of the chips into the middle as I can. You make a great point there, Joe, um, about the as the hand goes on, aces kind of get less and less valuable. You said like their value decreases. That's a great way to look at it because ultimately, it's a fantastic hand. It's one pair. It's a one pair hand. And how many times in your poker career do you get to showdown with one pair and it's a winner or you get to show like one, one pair is not a particularly strong hand at showdown. And it's funny. Um, you know, if we played some of our other hands, the way that we play aces aggressively, it almost doesn't matter what we have because we're not getting to showdown very often. <laughs> but, uh, it, the problem with, um, yeah, well, I can't say it any better than you did there, Joe. Um, a one pair hand is not going to be good on the river at showdown. Um, as often as, as you think, and it loses as often as it wins. Taylor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, part of this discussion around like, should you slow play? Should you not slow play? Um, I mean, I think a lot of people think of it as like, you know, you're setting a trap and here you're slow playing aces to, you know, just jump at people later. And, you know, it's partially true. You know, you're, you're doing that, but like, the real reason behind it is like you're doing it to like strengthen your calling range and like the other parts of your range as well. And to keep some of those like high value hands within your range. So you don't always want to just split your range, you know, top half is three betting, then you're calling these and then you're folding the rest because uh, it makes it really easy to play against yourself. Um, but that doesn't mean like you should always be slow playing aces either. Cause like, I think stack depth is a huge portion of this. And we kind of talked about it like Rob, like cash game, hundred big blinds deep. Then you talk about tournament poker and you know, you're often never playing hundred big blinds deep and you're often way shorter than that. And uh, it honestly can be like a really good spot to slow play aces later in tournaments when you have a shorter stack, because you don't need multiple streets of value. We talked about how often is one pair you know, good or a winning hand, look at the size of a pot. And then like, what was the hand that won said mm. pot and you get in the smaller sides, 
You know, if it's a 20, you start with 20 big blinds and it's a 40 big blind total plot, pot, yeah, one pair can definitely win those. Uh, if you're talking about a 200 big blind pot, uh, unlikely that a single pair is going to be just winning those pots just due to like, you know, large hands and stuff like that, so on and so forth. But like, so then you get into those spots and like aces, you know, can be a nice, you know, just sit there and hold because people will stack off with top pair of Kings, top pair of Queens, top pair of Jacks in those like smaller stack spots. And then aces do an extremely good job of protecting yourself against those hands uh, when you do decide to slow play them. So there are definitely situations to slow play aces and potentially slow play Kings uh, from that aspect. I'm kind of of the aspect of, I'm never going to slow play Queens um, Mm -hmm. just due to their much more vulnerable hand. Um, But I I definitely think there's situations uh, to be slow playing. I think that's really, really smart. Uh, And it, Again, <clears throat> you know, thinking about pocket kings is another hand that people think, you know, I'm going to be trappy and slow play this, but kings are way more vulnerable than aces are. Like they're really just on a completely different level. If I if you were going to say, you know, Jim, give me one hand that I can never slow play, I would I would say pocket kings. If you just if you're going to have one hard and fast rule because it's really strong hand, but it's also vulnerable, um, and queens are twice as vulnerable. Um, and, and there's also just more hands that, that beat it. Um, King, aces is nice because you're never going to have to worry about seeing any overcard on the flop, but there's still tons of flops. You do not want to see, you don't want to see seven, eight, nine. You don't want to see all hearts when you've got two black aces. Um, there's lots of ways that you can get yourself in trouble. Um, and, and, and one other point I wanted to make just quickly is, uh, th- those, those, when you do win a big pot, with one pair of aces, it's because you got them in preflop against another really good hand. That's how you win a 200 big blind pot with aces um, by getting them in preflop. So that otherwise you're going to lose, lose a big pot because someone made a weird two pair um, or you're going to win a smaller pot uh, post flop a lot. So that's a, that's a really good argument for it. I also think, uh, you know, the, what is the, uh, the theme of the month is C betting, right? Yeah, and kind of. the hardest thing for me right now is figuring out what to do for the C bet, what percentage to C bet, what not. And aces in particular creates all sorts of problems because again, on seven, eight, nine, it's an overpair. And if you don't bet it, then you're showing weakness. And so therefore, then if they can pounce on you and, and bluff, and then you're going to be like, oh, I got aces and I've lost it. Um, and even the boards, unless it's a super dry board, ace, something like ace, seven, two what do you do with those cards at that particular moment? And I think that particularly earlier when in my career, um, playing them fast was always the thing to do because it took away that decision process. Mm. Right now, but you should really be getting some of your, some of your, um, your uh, EV per session from, and if you miss out on it, seven, eight suited is not going to do, uh, do it justice. Right. <laughs> Um, no, that, that's very true. I mean, it, it does come down to like, how comfortable do you feel post flop? And I think that's uh, maybe, you know, part of the post that we had here uh, about, you know, did, did I just get, you know, too fancy with aces, but like in this post uh, that we're talking about that, we kind of just kind of divulged and just started talking about slow playing aces. Um it's honestly an insanely good flop um, for uh, seven high 11 here. Cause you get a deuce four nine and you're talking about you know, how comfortable are you playing post flop? And like on those types of flops, like I'm insanely comfortable playing my aces there. Like it sounds great. Um, I mean, ultimately he gets it in versus you know, top pair plus a flush draw. And then the flush draw comes in and then you're stuck thinking, Hey, did I, you know, make a mistake? But um that's kind of like the best case scenario for them there. If they've got, you know, other over pairs, if they've got top pair, top kicker without the redraw, like you have them in such uh, a bad shape and they don't realize it. And it's just a really good spot to then, you know, try and use some sort of post flop edge that you have 
and now with the added benefit of having aces in your hand, uh, you should feel really comfortable, but you can't get stuck thinking like, oh, I had the best hand pre-flop. Uh, I had the nuts. And then now you look at a board and you're like, okay, well, I don't have the nuts here. And then I feel like a lot of people view that as a degradation and, you know, play weaker or, you know, suboptimally just because of that type of thing. Like, oh, all of a sudden now I've got to protect and I've got to bet huge because there's a flush draw out there and I don't want the flush draw to come in. Uh, or, you know, I don't want the board to pair because they're going to have one of those cards. And you, you get into those types of situations. You just have to be, if you're going to slow play the aces, just be ready to embrace those situations of, yeah, you're going to get it in versus a pair. And then the board is going to pair with that pair and they're going to have trips and then you're going to have aces <laughs> and you're going to go, oh man, you know, why didn't I just, you know, go all in pre-flop because then they would have folded their jack four, but all of a sudden it went jack, jack eight and now I'm out here losing because of it. And it's like, well, you know, it's going to happen. There's probability within poker, but like 85, 90% of the time you're going to stack that person when it comes jack high and they don't improve at any other point in the hand. So um, you just got to be comfortable and understand all those situations, have that foresight to see, you know, what are the future streets going to look like and how am I going to get all my chips in the middle? Because sometimes the answer to how do I get all my chips in the middle is to just call and then on later streets, let them continue their uh, aggression. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, So what are some of the times that we might, or what are some of the factors that we might find that would make us choose, okay, now is the time to slow play versus the time to raise. So the first one that jumps out to me is going to be stack size. And that's because basically if you never had more than a hundred big blinds in your stack, there would be no need for three betting to exist as a tactic in poker. The whole reason that three betting exists, re-raising pre-flop is because when you have the very best hands, you need to get more than 100 big blinds into the middle. Just by pot geometry, if, and you can, you can, I won't do the math live on the air, but if, if I make a bet and you call, and then we get to the flop and I bet pot and you call, and we get to the turn and I bet pot and you call, and we get to the river and I bet pot and you call, that's 100 big blinds right there. And that's why we choose 100 big blinds, because it's a geometric pot size that makes it easy to get every chip in without ever being raised. So if you are playing in a game and you need to make, uh, if if you're playing deeper than that, and you want to be able to get those chips in, when you have aces, you have to make a raise at some point. And then because people were only raising with aces pre-flop, it was like, okay, well, if everyone thinks I have aces every time I raise, now we can start raising with some other hands. And that's basically where we got to with this madness today where people are three betting all the time um, when they don't have to. But for, for tournament chips, if you're playing less than you know 70 big blinds, it's perfectly sound to not even have a three betting strategy. If you don't need to have that branch in your decision tree, um, you don't need to because you can get all the chips in without raising. Um, that being said, so, so the question is then like, when would you three bet and when, when wouldn't you? So you'd be in that case, I think you'd, you'd be one of the nice things about raising is that it does also clarify our opponent's ranges when they continue. So it's less likely that you're going to get hit on that Jack eight, eight flop with someone care or with Jack eight, two, it's just less likely that someone's going to have Jack eight or eight, two or Jack two, um, in a three bet pot. So you can kind of simplify some of your decisions post-flop. Now, they can still have pocket eights and pocket jacks and pocket twos. So don't get me wrong. Um, it's not like you're never beaten those spots, but there's just fewer combos of hands that you have to worry about. Um, and uh, so the one thing that I would say that I'd be more tempted to call if I was if I was in a shorter stack situation where I just didn't need to put those, those chips in to, for pot geometry reasons, Another reason would be if there was someone to my left who was very aggressive, who was going to make that raise for me. Um, and then I could back raise or, or call at that point. That's a pretty good time to have pocket aces. Um, but there are sort of some trade-offs uh, for that as well. I don't know if, if you guys want to talk a little bit about what makes you more or less inclined to call or raise as well. 
Yeah, I think stack size is a, a big one for me because I when I'm sitting there in a hand, I'm always thinking, you know, like how many streets do I need um, to get all the chips in the middle? And granted, this is a cash game. I'm usually playing tournaments. Usually it's not pot size bets in tournaments. Usually it's actually like pretty small uh, size bets, especially with like continuation bets. Um, but I mean, if I'm sitting there with, you know, sub 20 big blinds and someone raises from early position or middle position, you'd be like, Oh, okay. You know, just jam the aces. Um, Cause they're going to call, they've got a strong range. And it's like, well, you're probably going to get the strong range anyways, but what about the weaker holdings that they have? You can actually induce them to make mistakes versus you. If you just call, you know, if they're opening King 10 suited and you jam, they're probably going to find a fold, but you can just call and see a lot of flops of which they'll continuation bet into you or they'll flop some sort of value hand and they can continue with that. Um, and hopefully it's not King 10 X, but you know, you, you're just kind of like trying to play the odds in that spot. And you're like, to me, that seems like a really nice spot to call because there's a lot of other hands that I also want to call with in that spot um, and not have to jam and not have to, uh, put all my chips in the middle and then be up against those types of hands and just kind of be in a bad spot. So aces kind of helps me protect those. Um, so I, I think about it a lot when I'm, you know, short stacked and I think it's going to be relatively easy to get all my chips in the middle with a, a flop check raise, uh, you know, call a few bets, maybe a, a raise on the turn, those types of things um, where I can, you know, build up a pot size and then, uh, start trying to uh, flip it and apply some pressure on my opponents. And then, like you said, aggressive opponents are really nice too. Um, pros and really experienced players uh, always have their eye out for squeeze spots. So prepping a squeeze spot for your opponent can be uh, the the chef's kiss of uh, <laughs> opportunities for you. If you can find that right, like, ah, here's a you know really aggressive opponent in the small blind that's got a jammable stack size and someone min opened and I can just call here and let them jam for 20 bigs and then I'm right there to just catch it. So um, it, it's harder to find those types of things because you have to know your opponents and you know make that guess of how they might play in certain spots. But that is another opportunity, I think, to, to slow play the aces. Yeah, and that's one of those things that you sort of say it's 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 like harder to find those spots, and you're kind of setting yourself up for some, you know, variance to not go your way. Uh, I do think that there's also an element of like is balance required here in, in a sense. Like it, it also depends a little bit on who are you playing against, how often you're going to be playing with them, how savvy are they uh, at hand reading, are they even putting you on a range. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one thing that, that you can, that you'll have to consider. And then also this sense of just, yeah, then you kind of, when you do call, you kind of have to play poker later, um, which is great. If you're like, you know, we all love playing poker, but um, it means that you can be wrong or you can make bad assumptions and it just creates other opportunities to make, uh, to make an error. Um, uh, so we'll get into that a little bit more here as well. Uh, Joe, what can I, uh, you've got your hand up there. I was just going to say, I mean, it was kind of similar to what you're saying in terms of who your opponent is um, as a, a primarily uh, low stakes cash player. Uh, balance is not something I need to worry about a heck right. of a lot. And the, the problem with slow playing at that level or trying to set up uh, a squeeze spot is then you end up multi-way with the aces and in a really, you know, it just destroys any of the equity that you have. And so I think that correctly understanding three bet rates or the likelihood of a squeeze in the, in the correct spot is going to be required or you're, or you really just shouldn't slow play them in those situations. And to take off on that point, a little Joe for recreational players in particular, we don't really have to worry. We, we shouldn't be too worried about like strengthening our passive ranges. I think we should worry more about polarizing or weakening our raising ranges. So like, we're better off keeping pocket aces in a raising range and adding other hands to that range to make us less predictable rather than taking excellent hands like aces and putting them in a calling range to make us less predictable. Um, there's arguments for doing both or having a mixed strategy, but typically players at our level 
are going to be under aggressing. So uh, I'm much more inclined to tell folks to keep make that make that uh, widen your three bet range um, and make you make yourself less predictable uh, that way because. You know, you don't want to be that guy that every time you three bet, everyone folds because they know you've got aces. Uh, so you also don't want to be like, you know, too far down the bluff Storini path where you're just every every <laughs> offsuit rag ace is getting thrown into the bucket there. But um, I'd still rather be on that side, you know, especially in our games. Uh, so let's let's one say. Other, oh, yeah. go One other this. one other thing about aces. Um, we're talking in a, a, a small stakes cash game. I definitely feel um, what Taylor has talked about in a tournament is definitely true. In a cash game, I think there's there's no other way to play aces mm. than to play them strong pre-flop. Mm. In a, you know, because again, you're trying to stack somebody. Now, when that person doesn't bet further, and you're you're in a three bet pot, and now you get a flop. And the flop is seven, eight, nine of hearts, and you've got two black aces, and the guy is going nuts on you. You have to be able to fold those aces. Yeah, you can't, you know, because you can't get married to them. I mean, they are aces. They're they're beautiful. They look so nice pre-flop, but there are situations where you can get rid of them later, and I think that's very important to make sure we do that. Yeah, that, that's such a key. That's such a key point, Rob. Um, because like I said, we're going to have to play poker later because now we're going to see a flop. We're going to have to hand range. And even though we feel like we're going to be way ahead of our opponent, you know, there are going to be those flops where listen, mathematically, it's going to happen a certain portion of the time. And you just need to, it's okay to be bummed out because you've got two black aces and it came six, seven, eight hearts. You can be bummed out, but you can't be entitled to that pot. You don't, deserve that pot just because you were dealt pocket aces and and even if you raised and did everything right and then the flop came out guess what kid like sorry you're just you're, you're not gonna win that pot and the the worst part about it is you might have to fold to a bluff like they might not even have the straight or the flush or a set or something um and you're just gonna have to be okay with occasionally folding the best hand in spots like that because the alternative is to lose a lot more um, by by losing big pots where you've, you know, especially if you're someone that doesn't three bet enough, you've kind of stapled two A's on your head and they can, they can see that when the flop comes six, seven, eight, three hearts, uh, they, you know, they don't need to have the, the actual straight or the flush to make you feel uncomfortable. So that's just another reason to, to strengthen or to, to, to widen that, that three betting range to make you less predictable. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more thing to kind of what Rob was saying, and I, I I totally agree with what he's saying. And to like put my train of thought of like why I think it makes sense is like in cash games, it's all about the like chip EV or like you know the cash EV on the table. Like you're not going to get your opponents betting into you when they don't have big hands because hey, it's not a smart decision, you know, like why, why inflate a pot and lose money when you don't have to, but in tournaments, there's like this aspect of like tournament life. And like, if we think about the situation where we're short stacked, it allows our opponents to put a lot of pressure on us because our tournament life is risk and we have to make tighter decisions because of that. So then because of that, they can bluff wider and they don't care as much about the chip EV because they've got this fold equity that's probably a little bit higher than it is in a cash game. And I think aces is, is a really good way of like having a shield against that ability of your opponent to be putting a ton of pressure on you. So it, to me, it's a really nice counteracting balance because you know someone's going to be betting into you wider if you slow play them pre-flop and kind of show some weakness and you know allow them to try and attack you but probably less likely that 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 that, that is going to happen in a cash game because mm. they'll just look at their hand and be like okay you know i know i either have a decent draw or i've actually got some sort of value or i've got nothing you know i'm, I'm just gonna stop betting so i think there is that like tournament icm value of your stack type of thing that is going to come into play and that's why me tournament player uh always kind of thinking about stuff from that lens uh is definitely appealed by uh slow playing aces in certain spots yeah joe yeah i just wanted to say too if you're if you're going to slow play 
particularly in a cash game, and this is specific to the hand, um, it crystallizes that this is a betting game, right? And you're betting that you're going to be able to maintain the best hand throughout the hand. Like in this hand, he got drawn out on, on the river, right? And he was ahead at every single street and until the last hand. He jams earlier, he wins the hand, but he doesn't get as much money. So you're, it's really that bet that goes all the way along more so than just the hand value itself. Yeah, that's a great point because there's always two pieces of tension in every poker hand uh, that we're talking that we're going to talk about. So there's this tension between oh, if I just shove preflop, then all these worse hands will fold and they won't make these disappointing, surprising hands and beat me. But you won't win any money from those lesser hands. So we got to kind of calibrate down to making our play expensive for them. And in fact, an expensive mistake for them, but one that they're going to make anyway, right? Poker is a game about putting other people in a position where they can make bigger mistakes or more mistakes uh, than you. Um, so that's, that's a, that's one part of it. I feel like I had something else smart to say. And now I completely forgot what it was. <laughs> Um, but I'm sure it was something really smart about, about pocket aces. Is there anything else that uh, people, Oh, and the other point of tension, the other point of tension. Um, so it's, it's between the expressing, like realizing the strength of your hand and having an element of disguise or confusion. And this is also another thing that, that is always in tension with us. We're like, well, I've got this really good hand. If I play it quickly, I kind of get the full value of its strength, but it's maybe a little uh, 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 cards up. Maybe it's a little transparent that I have it. So I could play it more slowly and add some disguise, but I'm kind of giving up some of the overall power, the strength of the hand itself by doing that. And I think that is a kind of tension that we all feel as recreational players. And the, the, it's never going to be fully all the way one way or all the way the other. It's going to be from situation to situation, which, which is more important to me right now. Is it if you're really deep stacked in a cash game, it's, it's probably more important just to get that raise in preflop because you want the pot to be big enough on the flop that you can get all the chips in by the river. If you're playing in a short stack tournament, again, just to, to pick on one factor that we're talking about, maybe the disguise is actually worth more than the absolute strength of the hand because it's not that important to get all the, the bottom chip in, but what's important is getting action um, and getting action from worse hands. So uh, that's something. That's, that's, that's interesting concept because i think a lot of times people want to slow play big hands because they're afraid they won't get value mm -hmm. and i think it, it, and i struggle with this but i think one of the things that i've tried to do is if i have a big hand i'm going to go for that value right now more often than not if the person doesn't have a strong enough hand to call me you're not going to get any more money out of them anyway you said it buddy so you might as well get the money when you can. How often have you gotten to the river after checking the turn and saying, damn, I sh should have bet the turn because yep. by the river, you, there's, there's nothing left. There's no hope anymore. <laughs> they don't have hope for their hand. So they're <laughs> not going to call you because it's either they either have it or they don't. So you miss your opportunities earlier in the hand to make the kinds of bets that they may still call. And if they don't call, well, they probably weren't going to call a bet on the flop anyway. So what's the difference? Yeah. And like, you can't get called by a turn by a draw on the river. You can't, but you can get called by that turn, by that draw on the turn. Right. And it's just, that's a whole brand. That's a whole part of their range that you could get a bet from on an earlier street that you just can't get a bet from later. So Maybe they're going to turn it into a bluff and, you know, bet into you instead. And so you've like created this mastery puppet master situation where you can get more money out of them. Um, but honestly, and, and, and full points for this other, you know, you don't get to choose when you get paid for making a hand. It, it actually takes you having a really good hand and someone else having an okay hand, but not so good that it's better than yours. <laughs> You don't want that. So it, it, it really doesn't come up that often that you have a really good hand and someone else has a second best hand. And the only way to like 
I think you said it perfectly, Rob. If they don't have a hand that's going to pay you off, they're not going to pay you off. So, so don't target that part of their range. When you have a hand, play as though someone at the table has a second best hand and will pay you. Because if they don't, you're not going to make any money anyway. And if they do, give them a chance to make that mistake. Um, so yeah, Joe, I mean, hit me. And I, I think, you know, along those lines, um, Split Suit says it all the time uh, in his posting, is that when you start to add up what you can get if everybody folds mm. and you just simply pick up the blinds or pick up mm. something on the flop, that tends to be a win rate over time. And if you lose that because you're trying to trap and get greedy and get more, then your win rate over time will be pretty diminished. It's a great point. And we don't see the opportunity cost of that, right? While we're playing, we don't, we just, we just, we just don't make the money. We don't see it not collecting in our accounts. We just don't make it. And, and maybe we even still make some money on the hand. So we're like, yay, I played good. I made money. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not really the business we're in. We're in the business of making the best possible decision in the long run. Um, so, yeah. So I think we've covered a lot of good stuff here today. I hope uh, some of our listeners find some valuable stuff in there. But certainly, just to sum up a, f- a few things before we go, stack size matters a lot. Position matters. Um, cash versus tournament matters a lot. Who's to your left matters a lot. And how comfortable are you playing post-flop matters too. Um, and I think uh, one thing we've kind of agreed on is that the default position should typically be to raise with aces. Um, but you might find some opportunities not to do so, to play it more passively, or even to fold. Uh, well, we're not going to talk about satellites uh, here, but I, there's it can even be correct to full aces preflop sometimes. Um, so there are no there are no easy answers, unfortunately. And then yeah, just when, when even if you are slow playing and you get to a point where it's time to put a bet out there, don't target the weak ranges of your opponents that aren't going to pay you off. Just don't target people that aren't going to pay you off ranges that don't pay you off. Just act as though someone out there has a hand that can pay you off and bet like they do. And if they don't you weren't getting paid anyway. And if they do, uh, you're going to collect there. So, all right, gang. Well, I think that's about wraps it up. We should thank our, ho- our uh, sponsors, website AMP and Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino. And I want to thank Joe, Taylor, and Rob for joining me here in the booth today and talking about this stuff. And John7high11 for his forum post. And you, the listeners. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon.